OK. It's 10 o'clock and the recording has started, so good morning, Florida and good day, good afternoon, good evening to our friends and guests attending from outside of Florida. Uh, we have a fantastic, fantastic um, level of engagement for this workshop. We, like I mentioned in our email, we have over 221 folks that have uh, signed up for this uh, virtual workshop, so we are blown away by the turnout and we're very excited uh, and thankful to everyone, have everyone with us today. So before we get into the workshop, I'm going to go over some housekeeping. Uh, first, um, we encourage comments and questions, particularly during the breakout sessions, which is going to be during the second half uh, of the workshop. To assist with bandwidth purposes, please have your cameras off and be muted when you're not speaking. Uh, you should see a, a chat button and you can use that tool to submit questions and comments. This workshop is being recorded, including the three breakout rooms, and soon after the webinar is complete, we will make sure that those recordings are available on the non-motorized program website. <clears throat> You will also see a follow up survey that's going to come soon after this workshop, uh, so please fill out that survey. It would really help us out. Uh, this workshop is available for AICP credits and also now new. We have PDH credits also available for this uh, workshop. You must attend the entire workshop session to be eligible for those credit credit hours, and we will uh, provide certificates at the end uh, of the workshop as well. You'll see that in an email that comes soon after. So for today's agenda, we're going to go over uh, a program update. That'll be my section in regard to the non-motorized program statewide. We're then going to turn it over to Kara Schwartz uh, from District 4, who's going to provide a more concentrated perspective of what's going on regarding non-motorized in the District 4 region of the state. Where they're going to have Alyssa Frank from the Palm Beach TPA provide much more focus on a particular count station that we're going to be talking about further today. Uh, and then very exciting, very thankful to have the Dutch Cycling Embassy partnering with FDOT again. Um, and they will be leading the breakout sessions uh, for the second half of this session today. Uh, <clears throat> when we're about 10 minutes left in the total workshop, we'll have a regroup and we'll use that time to um, have some final questions. Hopefully we can have some big takeaways that we can discuss uh, and then we will close at 12. <clears throat> so. Starting with the program overview of the statewide non-motorized traffic monitoring program. Okay, my name is Eric Katz. I am the program coordinator uh, for this program. I'm an in-house consultant from Marlin Engineering and myself and our transportation data and analytics team have been hard at work at developing the statewide program since May of 2018. The purpose of this program has been the same since we started, which is to collect statistically valid bicycle and pedestrian or non-motorized traffic volume data so that traffic volume statistics can be calculated and published annually. For those that are brand new to this program, we have broken down the program into four mini sub programs, including our continuous counts program, our short term counts program, our data repository and our public outreach. Um, so I'm going to now go briefly over what's going on regarding those four program pillars, uh, and then I'm going to pass it on uh, to Kara to provide more details about District 4. So starting with short term counts uh, to date, we have successfully deployed uh, short term counters at 128 stations uh, across the state of Florida. Uh, all seven districts have been covered. We did not uh, and cannot do this alone. So we are very thankful to all of our local partners who have been involved in our loaner program where we provide equipment. We provide training on how to use that equipment properly and then we share the data at the end. Um, so primarily what we have on loan available for the state of Florida are bicycle tubes and infrared counters. Uh, our office has experimented with other types of technologies as well. Uh, we have used smart cameras 
at a handful of these locations as well, which have been very insightful. Uh, and like I said, we have over 30 agencies statewide that have been directly involved in helping us deploy these counters uh, all across the state of Florida. So what I'm showing now is our calendar, our deployment calendar. So what we do is we have one big pile of equipment um, that we move district by district. Um, so we started this round in September of 2021 in District 2. Uh, and we have continued to move that pile around the state. So we're in January. So right now those counters are located in District 5 and District 1 North. So that's the Polk County, Orange County, Volusia County, Orlando region of the state. And then in a couple of weeks we're going to be in Feb uh, we're going to be in February and that'll be the District 7 deployment and District 1 West. Um, so that will complete our first on peak cycle of the state. Um, and for statistical purposes, it's good that we try to count twice a year. So starting in March, we're going to repeat uh, that cycle going around the state. Um, and then we will complete our uh, two round deployment uh, in August of 2022. So we'll have on peak date numbers and off peak numbers. So one of the big um, reasons on why our office is deploying short term counters is because our primary role with the transportation data and analytics office historically has been managing the 350 continuous motorized counters that we have around the state of Florida. So it was our office that was tasked with now developing a non motorized traffic monitoring program. So we want to make sure that where we are placing these continuous counters, meaning that that's physical infrastructure that gets embedded into the ground, into the roadway, we want to be very confident that that was the right uh, choice of where we place that counter. So we cast a wider net with the short term counters and then we can use make use that data to make a data driven decision on where those continuous counters are going to be placed. So right now we have 13 continuous counters that we are managing uh, statewide across all seven districts. Um, so we're still learning about the capabilities of these counters. We're validating their accuracy and we also have to maintain these counters. So just to give some brief uh, highlights on what it takes to maintain the counters thus far. Some of these counters have been in the ground for close to three years. Some of them are less than a year old, um, but what we've seen so far is that um, we have to um, address water intrusion. Sometimes we have to um, address wildlife intrusion. Vegetation control such as tree branches are growing and they're blocking our sensors, so we got to make sure that the sensors are have a, a clear field of view. Um, some of these counters are powered by solar panels, so they have to be scrubbed every once in a while. Uh, some of these counters are uh, powered by batteries, so we have to upkeep those batteries as well. And then just as we do in the motorized program, we're constantly testing these sensors and making sure that over time they are still valid. Um, so that is an ongoing task. And then sometimes these counters just go down and we have no idea uh, why. So that's where we have to reach back out with the vendor and coordinate with them on what the issues are, because just as we, as we do in the motorized program, it's our task to make sure that these counters are on 24 7 365. Um, one of the uh, two methods of extracting that data primarily ideally would be polling uh, these counter stations and the majority of our counters are uh, do have polling available, but some of them are not. So we have to send a technician out into the field to manually extract that data. Um, so these are just some of the challenges involved with the day to day management of the continuous counters. Um, and what we're seeing so far in the early stages of our program is that it's a big task and there's no way that our small but very mighty TDA office can manage both short term counts and the continuous counts together and all the rigorous QC that we want to do uh, with these count stations. So one of the big messages that you're going to be hearing about this program over time is that as our network of continuous counters goes up, our management or day-to-day -day management of the short-term counts is going to go down. 
And that's where we're really encouraging the state of Florida to take ownership of short term counts in the geographies that you manage. Uh, we would love to work with you, coordinate with you. If you don't have equipment, that's where our loaner program comes in to help. We can provide training. Uh, we're in the midst of developing manuals and training videos that are going to help set up uh, the state of Florida to always have access to equipment. Now, whether it's short term counts or continuous counts that we're collecting data on, another one of our big tasks uh, for this office is to make that data publicly accessible. Uh, so you, some of you have may have noticed that about a month ago uh, you lost access to our data repository. That's because we were going through a migration right now. We're going to be developing a new database, um, which is going to be better, better than what the original database was. Uh, but for now, if you go to the non-motorized map, and I'll make sure that these links are shared into the chat, you can go into the non-motorized map. You can click on a dot, and when you click on the dot, You'll get a dialog box that'll open up and that'll give you some general information about that count site. And then you'll see links saying like more info, bike ped split. That is what you click. And when you click that, you will get access to our PDF reports uh, that are available. And that's where you're going to see uh, the data that's in table format. And we've created some graphs and charts. So here's just a quick zoom in on what these um, reports look like. This is a great template to consider if you are maybe wanting to modify your program so that you can make it uh, so that we can roll your data up into the statewide database. Uh, some key information is what I have here in red. So if you want to be able to, whether you're part of our loaner program or your agency independently collect data, if you want to share your data with us, key information is we need to have a location name. We need to know the GPS coordinates. We need to know exactly what count type this is. Are you counting bikes, peds, both? We need those details. We need to know the start and end date of the count. We need to know the direction or side of road that those sensors are on. What's the facility type? Are these bike lanes, sidewalks, shared paths? Uh, what's the county and what's the district? Uh, and then once you give us that information, we will then develop a site station code and that is important for when we come to the point of submitting data to FHWA, they recognize these station codes so we can work together with you on that. Uh, so this is key information that we would encourage anyone uh, doing data collection. If you want to share that data with us, uh, this is some of the, the basic information that we need from you. And then you can see how we um, display the data. So we we typically do two week counts with the tubes and the infrared. Um, and then you break it down by hour so you can see all of the totals. We make any notes if necessary, uh, and then we also provide graphs and charts. Um, so this is where we're at so far with the repository. We are going to continuously make improvements. We'd love to get your feedback on what you would think would be needed to improve the database, uh, but this is where we are so far. So in addition, um, our fourth pillar is our program outreach. Uh, so we are now actively involved with national partners. Uh, we recently uh, in, were uh, invited to participate in a peer exchange hosted by FHWA. Uh, there's a link when I provide this slideshow at the end of the uh, session, you can click on that link to get to the report. Uh, there's going to be the National Travel Monitoring Exposition and Conference June 13th through 17th. We'll be participating in that. And then statewide, we try to our best to have periodic updates, whether that's in newsletters, webinars. Uh, we did have statewide meetings, but right now we're trying to get more used to doing virtual trainings uh, and different types of meetings. This is our first version of doing a virtual workshop. Um, so, you know, we'll continue to innovate and do our best to have an ongoing dialogue with the state. And if you want to invite us to have a local presentation to your MPO, your city, your county, feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to provide you a presentation. So at this time, I would like to pass it on to our next presenter, uh, and this is Ms. Mrs. Kara Schwartz. Kara Schwartz is from District 4, so I just started you know, finish talking about the state, what's going on. So now we're going to zero into the District 4 region of the state. And Kara Schwartz is the 
District 4 Traffic and Roadway Characteristics Inventory Project Manager. Kara has been with FDOT for about 29 years. She's got over 25 years of experience in data collection, uh, and Kara has been one of our key members involved with all non-motorized data collection matters occurring in District 4. We're very thankful to have Kara with us. Uh, and with that, uh, go ahead and take it away, Kara. Thank you, Eric. Um, on the next few slides, Oops, one moment, please. There we go. On the next few slides, I will present what District 4 has completed and what we are planning on doing in the near future. The first location we have is a permanent count site. It's on the New River Greenway, which is located in Broward County. This is a major east-west fully separated trail and is approximately 11 miles in length. During the site selection, the FDOT team placed uh, short-term counters at five separate locations along this trail. The continuous counter was installed mid-May 2020 and was the first non-motorized traffic monitoring site in the district. We ultimately decided to install the counter, the continuous counter, near the entrance of the popular mountain bike trail, which is located inside Markham Park. Now I'm going to talk about the future of what we're planning. Uh, recently, District 4 allocated uh, operating funds to the FDOT non-motorized traffic monitoring program for our five additional count, um, continuous counter locations to be in installed throughout the district. The funding is secured and the installation of these counters will be mid to late 2022. <clears throat> Once installed FDOT TDA or Transit Data and Analytics Office will manage and maintain these counters. District 4, the TDA and partners work together to select these sites. Um, the next few or the following slides, I will talk about where we're going to be installing these five counters. The first site is the Trans Florida Rail Trail, which is located in Indian River County. It's a fully separated trail with all types of recreational and student non-motorized users. The, this pedestrian bridge was completed approximately two years ago and spans over I-95. The trail connects to the Fran Adams North County Regional Park and Sebastian Middle School. Indian River County MPO partnered with DOT for the past two years deploying short term counts along the bridge. The data that was collected supports the decision to the installation of these continuous counters. The next site we have is on A1A. It is significant bike ped facility statewide. Um, it is a class one natural context classification ranking. This corridor is uh, designated Sun Trail and US bike route. There is a upcoming bridge and resurfacing project and adjacent to the bridge, um, the resurfacing project. And the installation will hopefully be done during the project. If not, shortly after we'll have it installed. Um, the planned location for the installation of this continuous counter will be at or near an existing motorized continuous counter. Our next site that we have, it's another site on A1A. This is at the South Causeway Bridge in St. Lucie County. The South Causeway Bridge um, is, this location is a C3 suburban context classification. This is an ideal location to gather pen and bike count data for potential lane repurposing projects for with the TPO, with St. Lucie TPO. The route connects to the designated Sun Trail US bike routes, as well as the Marine Science and Indian River Community College. 
The next site is um, State Road 838 Sunrise Boulevard at 25th Avenue, which is in Broward County. This location is a C5 Urban Center contacts classification, connects to commercial activities such as mall, retail, restaurant, entertainment, and much more. This is an existing high use transit stops on both sides of the roadway. And this location was part of a uh, recent transit non motorized data collection study. Within this study, there was um, determined that there was high crashes data involving ped, uh, pedestrian and bicycles. During this study, there were short term smart cameras installed that captured significant mid block crossings. In a proximity to the bicycle, there is a uh, bicycle share station which is located on the south side of the road near a bus stop. Our fifth and final site is um, the Boca Raton Tri Rail El Rio Trail, which is located in Palm Beach County. Our next presenter, Alyssa, uh, will be talking more about the El Rio Trail. This is a fully separated trail. It was also in the not um, part of the non motorized or the transit non motorized data collection. This location has direct access to Florida Atlantic University. The location is perpendicular to the Tri Rail Station and the El Rio Trail and is a perfect location to gather high ped and bike ridership. And one thing new that we're going to be installing, hopefully, um, is a uh, the public counter display. We've been doing research on that and hopefully this is will be installed when the continuous counter will be or hopefully if anything shortly after. Um, this would be the first public display that um, FDOT has purchased and installed and maintained on multi use paths in the state. Um, um, I'm going to Turn it over to Alyssa Frank. Uh, she is a pedestrian bicycle coordinator with the Palm Beach County Transportation Planning Agency or TPA. She serves as a liaison to the Bicycle Trailways Pedestrian Advisory Committee <clears throat> and leads the agency's walk bike safety audit initiative. Alyssa is passionate about equitable mobility, complete streets and public health. Prior to working at the TPA, she studied urban and regional planning at Florida Atlantic University and earned, interned with the Office of Economic Development in the city of North Miami. Currently, Alyssa is working towards earning her, ma her master's degree in sustainable transportation from the University of Washington. Take it away, Alyssa, and don't forget to turn on your screen or share your screen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me and being a part of today's webinar. Um, you already seem to know who I am, Alyssa Frank, a Ped Bike Coordinator with the TPA. So I am very excited today to provide a little more of an overview of the El Rio Trail in Boca Raton for those of us who are not familiar with this. So the El Rio Trail is about a 4.7 mile facility. Uh, a completely separated facility in the city of Boca Raton and for majority of its length it is a 12 foot wide shared use path. Um, this facility as you can see on the screen actually connects to various destinations in the city of Boca Raton including Florida Atlantic University, Palm Beach State College, Spanish River Library and Boca Raton Tri-Rail Station. Additionally, it does help provide access to uh, downtown Boca Raton which is great for um, commuters. This trail is heavily utilized by both recreational pedestrians, runners, cyclists, as well as students who are trying to access the universities and commuters trying to access um, their workplaces. So these are some images of the facility today so you can kind of get a feel for what it's like out there. Um, there are sections along the facility that do have a delineation down the center to designate the two way uh, directions. But for different um, areas along this facility, there is no delineation and you can see it does provide direct access to the tri-rail station. 
So I'm going to cover some history of the trail uh, prior to or in 2007, the Boca Raton Tri-Rail Station construction was complete. At this time, the city um, came to us and said, you know, there is an existing uh, shared use path facility along FAU's campus or Florida Atlantic University's campus, stretching from Glades to the northern extent of the campus. But we want to extend this facility to actually provide access to the tri-rail uh, station. So they said, hey, TPA, can you guys help us fund the extension of this facility? And we said, sure, apply to our um, transportation alternatives funding program, and we can help try to allocate some funds to that program or that project. In 2007, the city actually came to us with a formal application and were awarded $750,000 to construct an extension of the trail from a Spanish River Boulevard, which was previously the northernmost extent, to Clintmore Road, which is a little north of the uh, tri-rail station. In 2015, the construction of this extension of the trail was completed um, and open to the public, which was great news. This past year in 2021, the city came back to us and said, hey, TPA, we want to install lighting along the southern segment of the trail, um, really the segment that has majority of the destinations. Can you guys help us fund it? And we said, sure, you know, go apply again to our transportation alternatives pro or program for funding and we'll see what we can do. And they were actually awarded and prioritized $1 million to install lighting on the southern half of the trail, which we'll talk about a little more in depth in the next slide. This funding will be available in 2025 um, and the construction of the lighting will be able to begin. So in 2007, what was funded? In addition to the trail extension from Spanish River Road up to Clintmore Road, we also did include some safe crossings for the major roadways that the trail intersects. Moving north, um, the first major one is going to be Clintmore Road. And you can see that in 2007, there was no trail there. But you can also see that in 2001, in addition to, or 2021, in addition to that um, existing or now existing trail, we also did implement a safe crossing. So at this location, um, we constructed a pedestrian actuated signal to help notify um, oncoming motorists about when a uh, cyclist or pedestrian is actually going to be crossing. So that way they can stop and allow the user of the system to cross safely. Um, then again, the Congress Avenue intersection. This was a big one as it is uh, six lanes of traffic with the median in the center. So for this one, um, especially with the high speeds, we found that we did need to have a very visible signal at this crossing. So we actually helped fund the um, implementation of a hawk signal at this location. Um, so, you know, if you're a user of the non-motorized system here, you press this button and then the signal that you see on the screen actually changes to yellow and then red. And that signals to the motorized traffic on Congress Avenue that they need to stop at the stop bar and wait for the non-motorized user to cross the road. And then the third uh, intersection is Spanish River Boulevard. And so this one is still challenging to get across, but the safety enhancements that we did help fund greatly increased the ability um, for the non-motorized users to actually get across this roadway. So at this location, we helped fund a rapid rectangular flashing beacon, which again, if you're using the system as a pedestrian or cyclist, when you're um, getting to that intersection, you press the signal and then it changes um, to flashing rectangles on the signs and then that signals to the motorists, hey, we do have oncoming pedestrian or cyclist traffic, you need to stop. So looking to the future, what is going to be funded exactly in 2025? If you look at the left hand of the screen, you see actually that um, where the lighting is proposed for. And it will actually, the trail in this location um, does go under a couple of roadways um, to provide a more seamless connection along the trail and ensure that there aren't as many um, conflicts between the users of the system and the users of the roadway. In those tunnels, though, it can be quite dark, as you see on the screen, especially at night, but even during the day. So the lighting will be implemented in those locations to really provide more a bigger sense of safety for the users of the system and make them feel more comfortable, regardless of time of day, time of year, all of that. 
Um, and so this lighting again will be constructed um, in 2025, but along the southern segment of this trail. So we'll see the light between Yamada Road and Glades Road. And again, this will really help improve the connection for everyone at the tri-rail station trying to go to Florida Atlantic University, Palm Beach State College, the library, the downtown, really everywhere in southern Boca Raton. So now we're going to dive into data a little bit. Um, so back in January of 2020, Eric's team, TDA, actually did install some temporary counts at the Boca Raton Tri-Rail Station. Um, the counts that were used uh, were pneumatic tubes at infrared counters, as you see on the screen. So the tubes work as you know, the cyclist goes over and the tires actually change the pressure in the pneumatic tubes, which then selects or counts a person using that system. For the infrared counters, um, which is the image you see all the way on the right side of the screen, actually counts every cyclist that it captures going through that screen that you see. So what did the data tell us? Um, after reviewing it, we actually found that there was an AM or morning and afternoon peak hour in the south direction. So if you're leaving the tri-rail station to go into the central business district area of Boca Raton. We found that these uh, peak times were actually in the 8 a.m. hour and the 5 p.m. hour. And again, this is um, the count from that south location that we see, that south count station, so the one with the red circle on it on the screen. And so to really see what this data meant, we actually uh, looked at it in comparison with tri-rail ridership data. And what we found is that at the Boca Raton station, the high ridership hours or peak hours were again that 8 a.m. hour and that 4 p.m. hour, which shows us that there is a similarity in peak times, which then suggests that there is a high utilization rate of the trail as a mode of transportation and people rely on it to get from the tri-rail station to various destinations along the corridor. This then tells us that there is a need for a greater network of shared use paths to be used as alternative modes of transportation. So with that, I am actually going to be passing on the baton to Chris Brentlett from the Dutch Cycling Embassy. And um, Chris, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am going to request uh, Requesting control is disabled by the share company's administrator. Eric, are you able to uh, make that happen so I can share my screen, please? Uh, Chris, you don't you can't use the share button. No. Uh, hold on. I stand correct. There we go. Okay, uh, so yeah, good morning to those of you uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. Good afternoon to those of us in Europe. My name is Chris Brunlett. I'm the Marketing and Communication Manager with the Dutch Cycling Embassy, uh, and it's my pleasure to be coming to you from our office in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, just want to start out by acknowledging some, some people that have put a lot of work into this uh, this session, most notably Eric Katz at FDOT, uh, Alyssa Frank at uh, the Palm Beach TPA, and uh, Skadi Terpak at the uh, Netherlands Consulate in Miami. Um, this has been many months in the making, so it, it's great to see it finally happening and to see such uh, great interest in this topic. I will uh, just introduce you briefly to the Dutch Cycling Embassy if you're not already familiar with our organization. Um, we are a, uh, an organization that was set up by the national government here in the Netherlands specifically to act as an intermediary between the demand for uh, knowledge and expertise in cycling uh, from around the world and the supply of that knowledge and expertise here in the Netherlands. This is a country that has been building cycling infrastructure, developing cycling policy uh, for many decades now and has a lot to, of best practice to share with the world. So we uh, work with governments, uh, government agencies, we work with universities, we work with advocacy groups, uh, bringing experts and, and uh, examples of best practice to the table to help them sp solve the specific uh, challenges that they are uh, experiencing in their city. We do that 
from drawing from a, a vast network of public and private organizations. We now number uh, about 85 organizations within our network, uh, and they are a real diverse cross section of, um, of uh, areas of expertise. They are from the private sector, consultants, uh, transport, engineers, planners, architects, uh, and so on, uh, bicycle manufacturers, bicycle technology developers, and then from the private, uh, uh, sorry, the public sector, uh, we have a number of municipal governments, regional governments, uh, public transport agencies, uh, and universities that we're, we're also able to bring to the table. And we do so in a very uh, a, a wide variety of different ways and means. Um, most notably, at least pre-COVID, we were doing this in through face-to-face -face workshops and study tours. Uh, so the study tour aspect is bringing groups of decision makers here to the Netherlands, putting them on a bicycle, getting them to experience these conditions firsthand, uh, and then sitting down in the classroom setting and, and understanding, helping them understand uh, what they saw, uh, how that came to be, and uh, how that might be transferable to their own context. Inversely, we also uh, host what we call Think Bike Workshops, which are uh, bringing teams of Dutch engineers to uh, these specific cities and regions and working on uh, actual case studies, actual real life locations, uh, whether they're corridors, intersections, uh, multimodal hubs, uh, and helping uh, the local engineers and, and planners uh, learn, come up with solutions, but in doing so, uh, learning over a, a two or a three day program. Obviously, post COVID, uh, we've been doing a lot of this work online in a virtual setting, but uh, uh, we're already hoping that uh, the things by spring, summer will be uh, resuming into more face-to-face uh, -face setting. We also um, have developed a number of, of really uh, what I think are um, useful and, and, and uh, uh, practical resources to help uh, people um, who are, want to make the case for cycling in their city, the why and the how, if you will. Um, this is a book of best practices that we published uh, middle of last year that has 50 or so case studies from the Netherlands, real life projects. Uh, it's divided into about uh, 10 thematic, thematic topics um, with real uh, practical takeaways that you can learn from to uh, um, bring back to your your city. We've also uh, recently developed about a dozen uh, what we call Dutch cycling knowledge clips. They are all uh, they're about five minute explainer videos on specific topics. They cover uh, things like the bike train combination, which you might hear about today, uh, data collection and, and application, uh, bicycle parking design, bikeonomics, which is the the present presentation of the uh, economic impacts of, of cycling infrastructure and investments in cycling. Um, and we would uh, encourage you to uh, look those up and, and potentially watch them and, and share them. Last but not least, we've also on the specific topic of bikeonomics developed this pamphlet and inf infographic uh, working with the World Resources Institute um, and uh, would certainly encourage you to to visit that URL or, or visit our website and uh, and use that again to to make this uh, this uh, compelling case for uh, better cycling infrastructure uh, in your city. So, with that all said, I'm going to introduce the the three breakout sessions uh, that we have prepared today. We have um, six very experienced, very knowledgeable Dutch experts that are going to be sitting in those divided over those three breakout sessions, along with three very uh, um, well, generous uh, local experts that have given their time to support the, the Dutch experts. Uh, and you would have chosen your, your breakout session uh, when you registered for this, um, this workshop. So we've already assigned you to your breakout room, but we want to give each of the three breakout sessions an opportunity just to uh, introduce their topic to the larger group, to talk a little bit about what they're going to discuss in their breakout session, in case you want to go back and view the recordings of the other breakout sessions that you're not able to attend today. So without further ado, I'm going to start by introducing uh, Thomas Stratemeyer from Gaudapel, uh, who will talk a little bit about the, uh, the first breakout room that is uh, bike to train connectivity. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, uh, and hello from Amsterdam. Uh, together with uh, Ruben uh, Lundersloot from Lundersloot Consultancy, we're going to talk about uh, bike-to-train connectivity. 
I myself work uh, for Goudtoppel Consultancy, and we're going to talk about why we think that uh, that the marriage between the bike and the train is in potential the most successful combination in uh, in transport. What we have seen in the last 10, 20 years in the Netherlands is that trips that combine the bike and the train, that they really have the potential and, and maybe can be the only competitor of the private automobile. But in order to create this successful marriage, you have to work on a lot of things. You have to work on station area design, on bike parking at stations, on first and last mile connectivity, on, uh, on transit frequency and the quality of transit. So there are a lot of things involved. And in the breakout room, we will show examples of the Netherlands, but Ruben and I also both refute the local uh, context in Boca Raton and also will give some recommendations of improvements that, that also would fit the, the Florida context. And we're really happy to make an interactive session where we discuss these ideas with the local experts and, and draw some uh, lessons together. Okay, thank you so much, Thomas. And for breakout room number two, that is bicycle infrastructure comfort. Uh, I'm going to ask George Van Dorn from Royal Haskening to uh, say a word, few words to introduce his topic. Thank you, Chris, for giving me the floor. Uh, I'm George Van Dorn, working at Royal Haskening DC, and together with Adrian Prentis, we're going to talk about uh, um, comfortable about comfort, and we're going to explore what it is actually is what cycling makes comfortable. But we're also really looking at the, the, the human, uh, actually the person riding the bicycle uh, behind it for what's happening, what makes um, uh, a cycling ride comfortable, how can you integrate it with the spatial surroundings and how can you actually attract more people to use a trail or a cycling path on a day by day recreational or utilitarian basis and uh, make uh, sure that uh, your infrastructure is better used and actually that people are even happier using it. Thank you. Wonderful. And last but not least, uh, by far the most popular breakout session uh, is the third uh, data collection and application. And I'm going to ask Diodat Bohr from Cycle Data to say a few words on this topic. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, good morning to all of you. And uh, the pressure is high with so many people in a break, uh, breakout session. But there are two questions we like, uh, we hope to answer. And one is why is um, non-motorized data so important? And the second one is what can we do with non-motorized uh, data? Robin Klein and me will share about um, how, you, how you can use it. And uh, Robin will also share about an example from a region in Eastern Europe where also cycling is not as the same as in Holland. We also will talk about, some, uh, about generating data and promoting cycling at the same time. And uh, Robert and me, we are looking forward to share our stories with you. Thank you. Fantastic. So we have uh, hopefully a full hour uh, in these breakout sessions, so please make the most of them. All right, welcome back, folks. Everyone's starting to trickle back in now. Going to give it a few moments to see if everyone's back. All right, I'm starting to see the main room get flooded with names. Let's just give a few more moments. Okay, about a few more seconds. I'm starting to see some more names trickling into the main room. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Hope uh, these were some great breakout sessions. Uh, my original plan was to bounce around the rooms and see how everything was doing, but I was so nervous to crash the system and we had a few people in the main room that we had to get through some technical issues, so I just manned that room. Uh, but from what I saw in the chat, it looked like there was a lot of dialogue, so that's great. So I'm now gonna pass it to Chris Bruntlett, uh, who's gonna help us lead uh, what were some of the takeaways uh, from each of one of these three rooms? So go ahead, Chris. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, yeah, welcome back everyone. And uh, hopefully you had a good breakout session. We've got about nine minutes now to just kind of summarize the key findings and, and close this webinar up. So we're gonna go in reverse order from breakout room three to one. 
Uh, and I'm going to start by asking Liz in uh, the data collection uh, breakout session to just perhaps say a few words about their key takeaways. Liz, are you there? Waiting on a few more people. The, the meeting transition didn't quite work as smoothly as we'd hoped. Uh, I was in that room, and yes, you had a great takeaway from the presentations that were given, and I thank uh, Diodat and the other presenters on the uh, online. Um, yeah, I'm getting a message now from Liz saying that she's having trouble reconnecting. So yeah, if one of our other breakout leads and data collection can provide some a uh, couple bullet points. Tracy or or Robin or Diodat. Oh, <laughs> no, OK, we'll we'll switch to uh, number two. Uh, so, Connor, do you mind saying uh, a few words about uh, the Bicycle Comfort uh, breakout session? You're on mute. Oh, your sound's not working. Oh, it's all falling apart at the end. OK, let's try breakout room number one. Uh, and James, do you have a, a you online and able to say a few words around uh, the bike train connectivity? Also no sound from James. Let's give it a try from my side. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes, OK, OK. Yeah, I think in the bike train connectivity, we had a very good uh, connection to both sides. The more theoretical and uh, town planning part from uh, Thomas Stratemeyer, uh, I think a very good overview on which things you should recognize when you're working on this. Um, I did a more in-depth uh, view on um, how to to organize the bike train uh, connectivity and um, that even if you make a good bike train uh, connectivity that's not enough because finally you also need a good cycle network a safe cycle network to get to the station um, and um, so I showed some examples from the Netherlands uh, as well as Thomas did uh, which you net cannot compare directly with the um, American situation but uh, on the other hand it can help to uh, work on new ideas so it was a good session I think with some good reactions and good questions. Thanks so much Ruben and uh, Connor can we try you again or is your sound still off? Otherwise, Adrian and I might be available. Sure, yeah. Sure, sir. Adrian, do you want to say a few words about breakout room number two? Um, yeah, well, in short, we had two interesting uh, presentations, of course, because we gave them. But uh, Adrian uh, talked about um, uh, more strategically about uh, what is infrastructure, how can you how can you work with it, and um, I actually try to combine that with how. Do, what does it look like? What is what is comfortable infrastructure, and, ex and also about the uh, difference between uh, what is a fietser in terms of a very relaxed rider and a cyclist. If you look at English, it could sometimes be a road cyclist. And what does that mean for comfort and who, you, uh, who, uh, who do you want to target? But I've, for, for me, the main takeaway is actually that we only uh, uh, skimmed the surface and that there are so many questions and ideas actually left and also we, which is shown from the questions that I would have liked to go on for another two hours, but that, that's actually out of the question. Uh, Adrian, do you have something to add? Thanks, yours. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, it was it was really, really, really nice experience. Um, yeah, we, we worked um, a lot on trying to define what's infrastructure and comfort and, and what's what's the relationship. How can we uh, apply this this concept into the, the Rio Trail? Um, I could say that, that, that there is like always happen a lot of concern about governance issues like how can we really make it happen how can we deal with these issues um, 
so that that was a tricky part and, and, and that that would be for sure a follow-up uh, discussion if uh, if i have to say yeah thanks adrian and shores and this is last call for breakout room number three data collection is there anybody who wants to say a few words about uh, that one speak now or forever hold your peace can you hear me yes oh yay technology <laughs> All right, so we had a we had a great room. We had um, we covered everything from uh, talking about how important data is to what do we do with the data, um, and similar to others, there were a lot of questions related to government policy and how do we effectuate change using the numbers. So um, I think that's something we could have probably talked about for an hour or two in our breakout room. Um, there were also a lot of um, points made and questions related to how do we educate um, not only users on the facility about how to ride and work together with motorized versus non-motorized and micro mobility in the middle, um, but we also talked about educating people on how to use the actual traffic data itself. So, we collect a lot of statistics, but we have to do a good job of trying to um, explain what the numbers mean and how the numbers were collected in the first place. So we, we talked a little bit about that. And then um, we ended on a few really critical um, questions about how to start a program, how to get data collected, and how does the technology really work? Can we classify bicycle versus pedestrian if we put um, different technologies down to do that. So we kind of covered a lot in a short amount of time and, and anyone else that wants to speak up, go ahead <laughs> from breakout three. I think we'll draw a line under it. We're all out of time, but uh, yeah, I would encourage you to go back and watch the recordings of the breakout sessions you weren't able to attend and uh, the slide decks, uh, I believe, will also be distributed for your information. Uh, Eric, do you want to take it from here? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, this has been fantastic. Right now, everyone should see a blank takeaways slide, but I'll be gathering a lot of notes. And when I send the email, which will include the PDF of the presentations, I'm going to add some of the major takeaways that we discussed. And we're at our final slide, and I'd like to have one more guest uh, say hello and thank you. And that is our manager of the traffic monitoring division within the Transportation Data Analytics Office. I report to Mr. Eric Griffin. Eric, if you can please provide a few words. Thank you, Eric. Well, I'd like to thank District 4 Palm Beach Transportation Planning Agency, the Dutch Cycling Agency, the um, Netherlands Consulate, our partners, the current as well as prospective partners, all attendees, uh, for definitely joining this webinar series. Um, definitely, we hope that everything was informative, it was engaging, and we want to welcome everyone's comments, recommendations, and their support for making our transportation monitoring program uh, resourceful. So we hope that everyone is continuing to find themselves committed to the program, committed to making sure that we are engaging in making sure that everything is um, keeping safety and the Floridians target for zero fatalities and injuries, injuries. So we hope everyone have a great day and back to you, Eric. All right, thank you, Eric. So again, everyone, this has been tremendous. Um, so much thanks to all of our partners around the state and outside of the state. Uh, so much thanks to the Dutch Cycling Embassy so, for providing Florida with their wisdom and expertise. Uh, just want to reiterate uh, all the webinars, uh, all of the breakout rooms are being recorded, so we'll work quickly to get those posted onto our website. Uh, please complete the follow-up survey that you'll be getting soon. Uh, we'd like to know more about how this was and how we can improve the next time we do this. Uh, and you can uh, use that email to um, contact us regarding any logistics or questions about AICP credits, PDH credits. Uh, we're going to be working on getting certificates for everyone. Um, so hang tight. You'll be hearing from us from us again very soon. Uh, but with that, it is 1201 here in Eastern time. Thanks again, everyone. We will see you soon. Take care. Thank you all.